Hey guys, welcome to DIY Guitar Making here at my wonderful shop in Burnville, Pennsylvania. I have a lot of prep work that I'm doing for the fall workshops. And I know previously I was doing videos where we were doing a Q&A followed by a, an actual woodworking or guitar making demonstration. But at the moment, what I've decided is that actually there's no reason to put the demonstration and the Q&A together in the same video. It kind of makes for an excessively long video anyway, and half you guys want the demonstration and half are listening for the Q&A. So I'm separating them. And from now on, you will see me doing Q&As and demonstrations as separate videos. And I think you guys will like that, I think. But um, you guys know better than me. You can let me know. So today's a Q&A. Let's go ahead and... Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, for the next couple weeks here, as I'm getting ready for the class, just because I have so much to do, most of these videos will be back-to-back -back Q and A's, just because it's easier for me to knock out a Q and A and then just not have to worry about filming the rest of the day in the shop. So you'll see a lot of Q and A's. Okay, let's get to your cues so I can give you some A's. All right, the first one is from Matt Zim. And he's asking, uh, th this pertains to a particular video that I did on installing carbon fiber rods alongside your truss rod. So you have your truss rod in the middle and two carbon fiber rods on either side of the truss rod. What that does is it, um, the truss rod is already strong enough to support the neck against string tension. That's not what the two carbon fiber rods are for. The two carbon fiber rods on the side of the truss rod are actually to help prevent twist in the neck, which a single rod down the center doesn't prevent. Having those three rods does prevent that twist. Okay, you can check out that video if you want more information on that. But let's proceed to his question. Eric, I have a question. Let's say I want to install similar rods in my Orville LP Custom. Will this modification prove pro problematic? Prove problematic, that's hard for me to say. Will this modification prove problematic on a guitar with finish on it? I know I'll have to remove the fretboard to get access to the neck wood, but will the guitar have unintended side effects after, after I glue everything back together? Well, Matt, my first thoughts there is why do you want to do this in the first place is a very important question. Are you doing it just because you saw the video and thought, oh, that's a good preventative thing to do? Or are you doing it because you already currently have a problem with that guitar that you're trying to fix? Um, if you're, you're just going through all that trouble and removing the fretboard, which is a very risky operation, you know, you're, you're really digging deep into the guitar there. If it's not to save anything, I would really recommend not doing this because uh, there will likely be unintended consequences like you mentioned. Not to mention, actually executing this on a completed guitar that, um, you know, has the contour of the neck on it and everything, so you don't have your nice square flat surfaces like I do when I install these on a build. I'm dealing with a squared off neck blank, so it's real easy to get a nice straight cut on my router table Whereas when you have a finished guitar neck, it's a, a whole different beast trying to assemble a, basically a sled to go around that tapered guitar neck. Because you can't rely on the shape of the guitar neck to keep you straight. So it's, it's going to be a, a difficult process. I mean, even if I was presented with this to do this work, and you know, I have experience doing this stuff, this would be the kind of thing where I would go, ah, do I really want to or have to? This, you know, it, 
there's just a lot that can go wrong. So I would honestly recommend against it. Now you had asked about the finish. Uh, I don't really see any problem with the finish except for the, if you're already uh, somewhat experienced with doing guitar repair, you already know that when you're removing things, you're dealing with heat and heat can very easily damage the finish. But that's not particular to this job. That's really anything you'd be doing. If you've done a bridge re-glue or something like that before, then you're, you already know this and you know to be careful. So that's the only issue with the finish that I would see because you would ask specifically about the finish. But again, I'm just, you know, my question to you is, are you doing this because you think you should uh, simply because other other guitars have it and you think it's cool or are you doing it to fix an already warped neck? How you proceed really depends on that question. And let's go to the next question. Okay, Mark Husbands. Um, this is a comment. We have a little bit of a thread going on here about um, through, throughout the past couple Q&A videos, I had some questions about building a guitar with no radius on the top, and that led to some of you guys just giving me examples of instruments that don't have a radius on the top. And so here we have another one. Mark Husbands is mentioning resonator guitars, and uh, also called Dobros. They don't have a radius on the top. And so I just wanted to share that with you guys because it's interesting. Uh, by the way, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to beat that dead horse again. <laughs> if you want to, you know, hear about whether or not you should have a radius on the top on a guitar, the answer is, first of all, yes. And I talk about it in the previous two or three videos that we talked about this. Mark Husbands writes, Resonator guitars, Dobros, are for obvious reasons built with flat tops have high string tension and are braced with posts, sound wells, or, of course, the tone and volume is not primarily from top resonance. But reducing vertical bracing is a common goal. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Next question. All right, Bill Stoner writes, I noticed the pile of cutoffs on the floor behind you. Obviously, you have been very busy. Can we assume that that pile is not just scrap? I save virtually all my cutoffs. Never know when a small piece of wood might find a purpose. No need for firewood in Florida. He's in Florida. Thanks for your very instructive and entertaining videos. Well, thank you, Bill. I'm going to disappoint you here. <laughs> but yeah, let me show you the scrap pile. I've got lots of scrap, actually. So he's talking about this lovely mess right here that I have. But hey, I got more scrap than that. I got all of this. And uh, I think I even got more back here. It's dark in this room. Scrap, scrap, scrap on the floor, scrap back there. And I'm really only showing you all of this Actually, there's a whole other room back there I forgot about, which definitely has scrap in it. I'm really only showing you all of this to piss you guys off even more, because honestly, all of that's getting burned. All of it's getting burned. I might use a little piece of, you know, the ebony or the rosewood for something here or there. And honestly, the reason for this is because as soon as I burn that, literally... Days later, this pile will be there again. It comes back. Like, it just materializes. I don't know how it happens. It's like magic. But it just keeps coming and coming and coming. So, I can't afford, unfortunately, or fortunately, I should say, I can't afford to be a wood hoarder or a scrap wood hoarder. When I first started doing this, that was absolutely my impulse. I would save, like, every little bit. And eventually I just ended up with, there was honestly an entire room that was dedicated to scrap and it was all 
shit that I was never ever gonna use. It had been there for years. And so at some point I just realized, and you know what, this was part of my journey coming up from just starting out as more of a hobbyist and then be it becoming something that I do full time and every day. Obviously, you generate way more scrap that, that way. So, um, you know, I guess it's just a different mentality for whether you're a hobbyist or you're, you're doing it full time. So I would be up to my neck in scrap wood if I, if I didn't just burn it. And you know what I'm going to say to defend myself is that burning the wood is reusing the wood. It's generating heat for my shop. I'm not burning it outside. I am burning it in my wood stove in the winter. So there you go. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't see anything wrong <laughs> with saving scrap. I, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, every, everyone's doing something different here within Luthery. Um, and I know a lot of you guys are building guitars, but then you're also building other things, cutting boards and, you know, things for the house, furniture. And in those cases, there's all kinds of fun things you can use your scrap for. And in fact, you know what, I'm going to give you a pretty fun one here that um, I keep wanting to do and actually do plan on doing, but just haven't done yet. And that's uh, when my bandsaw blades break, the, at least the smaller quarter inch ones, you can make a hacksaw out of those broken bandsaw blades and some scrap wood pretty easily. I haven't done it yet, but um, I think that would be a fun thing. I, I have so many broken bandsaw blades, I could make a hundred hacksaws. Anyway, what do you guys use scrap for? That's why I wanted to bring up this question. What do you, you guys use scrap for? Please let me know. I'd love to share that with everybody else and just get into it and discuss like all the cool things you can make with your scrap wood. And maybe I'll see some opportunities for myself as well and I won't burn all of it. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Okay. Next question is from Dave Wilson. And Dave writes, Hi, Eric. I'm on my third classical guitar using your True Oil finishing class, which is very well done, by the way. Well, thank you, Dave. Number six in total is... Okay, he's saying he's on his sixth guitar, so he's still a newbie is what he's saying. Six is, six is pretty legit, honestly. Uh, I don't, you know, know where the line for newbie is to be drawn, and uh, honestly, I don't particularly care about drawing that line, but six is, you've, you're doing something. That's cool, man. Uh, he, continuing with his question, the last two, however, had the same issue in places, which I'm sure is something I'm doing wrong, but I'm hoping you might know what. And he has an image here, which I'll put on the screen. The area in the upper left of the back and a little on the right. Uh, I was thinking it had something to do with the filler or maybe a sanding issue, but have no clue. Thanks in advance, Dave. All right, Dave. Um, so most likely, well, first a caveat. Pictures, I get pictures all the time with finishing questions and pictures are very uh, difficult to work with. So there could, I could be wrong. There could be something else going on. It's always hard to tell what's going on in a picture when it comes to finish questions. Even harder than, I'd say this is even worse than the wood identification pictures that so many of us uh, internet woodworkers and guitar makers get. Those ones are even worse. You know, you get a, a picture of something and say, hey, what, what is this? Tell me. I don't know. Anyway. Finishing this, I think I do know what it is, just because this is the most, would be the most likely culprit here based on what you've said and based on the way the picture looks. It looks like a sand through. So it looks like uh, at some point you were level sanding or just buffing with steel wool between coats or whatever you were doing, you sanded through in those areas. And it also makes sense typically when that happens uh, the first place for it to happen is tip typically near the edges. So that's another reason why that's why what I think is going on. 
The thing with true oil is it's very hard to, it doesn't repair well like an evaporative finish does. So evaporative finishes are your nitrocellulose lacquer, shellac, those are both evaporative finishes. And when you sand through your coats and even you know into bare wood on an evaporative finish, you can, to do a touch-up repair or something, you can spray more layers on there or rub in more layers and they will bite into and melt into the previous ones to create sort of a uniform look to it with no witness line. With oil finishes though, you're going to have that witness line which is what you're seeing. It's a line that is telling you where the old finish meets the new. So I'd say you sand it through. Keep in mind that oil finishes it's really about nailing the application, okay? I very, very rarely have to even use anything between coats. Steel wool, certainly not uh, sandpaper, um, because I just focus on really nailing that application so I don't have runs or anything to level out. Some people will, uh, just you know, from getting advice, somewhere will be or confusing it with advice for other finishes like lacquer they will sand between every coat regardless of how well the coat came out and that's really not the the purpose the purpose is you're leveling out uh, blemishes or runs or lint and things that get trapped in the finish but honestly don't fix it if it ain't broke if you nailed that application start the next one okay so that's something to keep in mind you might have just gotten too aggressive with the steel wool or sandpaper or whatever you did to sand through that true oil finish. Okay. Um, oh, and he had mentioned he's taking the true oil course. I just want to mention that that true oil course is also a part of the building an OM acoustic course. So if you buy that full course, you still get the true oil course at the end. So if you're considering buying the True Oil course, do also consider just getting the whole course because then you get everything. Just wanted to throw that out there. All right, thank you, Dave. I hope that helps. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so this question is from the Members Forum, which is a forum. I just talked about the online course, Building an OM Acoustic. You uh, become a member of the Members Forum when you purchase that course, okay? So, Hugh Goosen writes, Hi all, I was just wondering, does anyone have any wisdom to share as to why it would not be a good idea to radius a fretboard before gluing it to the neck? This would seem to eliminate the need to mask off the body and the awkward clamping of a straight edge across the body. Looking forward to your thoughts. And he was throwing this out to the whole members forum, in which case, what's great about that is there's, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but about 500 members in the members forum right now, more or less. And so you're opening it up to all those members and he's gonna get responses from other people. And actually I have a great response here that I saw from my buddy, Lamar Duffy who took my hands-on workshop in, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, 2019 or 2018? What do you think, Lamar, if you're out there? Is that when you took the class? I don't remember. Something like that. But he's a great guy, uh, and here is his answer, which I'm gonna share because it basically sums up my thoughts on it too. He says, that is a common alternative. You can even buy pre-radius fretboards and there are jigs and machines to help you radius the fretboard that only work if you do it before attaching the fretboard. Yeah, Grizzly sells a fretboard radiusing machine, a very expensive, very, you know, single purpose machine, which is pretty cool. I haven't used it or anything, but I like the idea. Eric may weigh in on his preference to do the radiusing in place, which is my preference. I think the idea is that you get a more precise result 
if you do the radius sanding with the fretboard glued and neck placed on the body. Especially with regard to the fall, the fall away you have above the 14th fret. If the fretboard is pre-radiused, you may still need to do a little fine tuning of the radius sanding after the neck is in place, especially in the fall away area. This would help you reduce the amount of fret filing slash radiusing you might otherwise have to do later. So you might still have to do some masking to protect the body at that point. Thank you, Lamar. That's perfect. That's almost exactly what I would say. Yeah, just two things I want to add to that. One is, I think he already mentioned it also, but I just want to stress that most small time guitar makers, especially hobbyists, do just use a pre-radius fretboard. A lot of them, if they're using kits, of course, are just buying a pre-radius fretboard and they're just accepting the, uh, the problems that come with that and uh, the fact that in the end, there might be some imperfection to your fretboard, especially at, like he mentioned, that fall away area just past the 14th fret is where the real problem comes from. So, you know, the problem is this. If you pre-shape your fretboard before you attach it, then once you attach it and you glue the fretboard tongue down to the body, you're going to have a hump at the 14th fret. And if you've left yourself no way to level out that hump, then you just have to live with it. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a big misconception with the fretboard radius sanding, and that misconception is that Getting the radius onto the fretboard is the part that is tedious and takes a very long time, and that's actually not true. Getting the radius applied to that flat board with your radius sanding beam, you could have that done in like 30 minutes if the board was already dead flat. The reason why this job takes hours, you know, five, six hours, something like that, is because you are leveling the fretboard down to its lowest point. So even if you started with a perfectly radius board, you're at best saving that 30 minutes of applying the radius, but really the bulk of the time is just leveling. It's leveling the whole thing, okay? I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say about that. I hope that makes sense. And you know what? That's all the questions I got. Yes, that is for sure all the questions I have. All right, I'm gonna get to work here. Please send me more questions. I really like doing this Q&A. It's actually a fun way to start my day. I'm really enjoying it. I hope you guys are liking it. Let's keep doing it. Bye for now. I just wanted to add something to this video. This is an important, timely update on the fall workshops. I have three open spots. That's right, three, because I had not one, not two, but three people cancel on the fall workshops. Cancellations are, you know, I always like to say they're very rare. They almost never happen because people put in a deposit to take the class, but this is, my unlucky year, I guess. Uh, lucky for you guys though, because one of the students upgraded to some pretty sweet wood. This is a set of Madagascar rosewood. Ordinarily in the workshops, the default wood that you build with is East Indian rosewood. And just to give you an idea of the value, East Indian Rosewood, a set of East Indian Rosewood is about 100 bucks, give or take, depending on the quality and who you get it from. This, I spent about 540 or 550 bucks on this set. And to the first person who signs up for one of these open spots in the workshop, I'll just, you get this automatically, okay? instead of the East Indian Rosewood. And you also get, he also upgraded to Torrified Spruce instead of just regular Sitka Spruce. You get that as well. 
So I'm definitely eating a lot of cost there. But, you know, they got me in a sort of desperate situation. <laughs> it's what happens. Um, yeah, it, you know, it sucks for them because it's, it's not great to have this happen to them too and it sucks for me and <laughs> obviously it's great for you guys, especially whoever wanted to get in those fall workshops. So the dates I'll put on the screen somewhere and again, the first person gets that upgrade and uh, yeah, it's an opportunity. All right, guys. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.